Hey everybody, I'm Ryan Doyle, and I think random encounter tables are great. They're a huge part of what makes my latest campaign so different than others I've run. They're part of the reason I called this channel the Verdigree Table, and even if you don't use them as much as I do, I think they can be a very useful tool for any dungeon master. I'm making a whole video on how encounter tables work, as per the book, and what makes them good, and then I'm going to do one describing how I've been using them the past year or so as the core of my open world sandbox campaign. But I wanted to kick off this little series with something that will hopefully be useful to you immediately, whatever experience level you're at, to make your game night that much better. So here's 10 ways to create better random encounters. Number one, location, location, location. 2d4 plus one goblins, boring. But what if they're hiding up in the treetops, or they're on the other side of a ravine with only a rickety old bridge crossing it, or they're on the opposite bank of a river? Maybe it's a river of lava, or acid, or sentient ooze. Find yourself a cool battle map online, or just doodle some patches of quicksand on a basic map, and things are instantly a little more interesting. It could even be a location that the PCs will want to put on their map and revisit. A potential safe house or stronghold location if they, you know, clear it out and fix it up. Or maybe these goblins are harvesting good berries from the sacred bushes in the druid's grove. Or they're trying to solve the puzzle lock on the ancient tomb of the dwarven lords. Two. Layers. This is kind of a subtype of location, but I think it deserves its own entry because coming upon a creature in their lair can add a whole lot to an encounter. A monster might run at half health or whatever, right? Out there in the wilds hunting, but it's gonna fight to the death to protect its home. Plus, now we're talking about lair actions and traps and environmental effects. Additionally, lairs are where the monster keeps their stuff, right? A dragon on the wing is probably not carrying anything, maybe like a goat, right, that they're about to eat or something. But you find their lair, though, and you find their hoard, and maybe other things as well, right? Minions, prisoners, uh, an egg, right? They're young. Patient players might wait for the monster to leave the lair, or maybe they'll come back at a later point when they have more XP or reinforcements. Number three, the environment. Rounding out the location-based trifecta here, we've got the environment. That rickety bridge over the gorge or that lava river can be a challenge in its own right, even without goblins shooting arrows at us while we're trying to get across it. If a tree falls in the forest and you're sleeping underneath it, do you even get to make a deck save? Uh, ever get caught out in the rain, right? Ever hike a hundred miles over four days in the rain? I have, kind of. Maybe your rations got moldy, right? Or your armor starts to rust. Maybe you just gain a level of exhaustion because there are puddles in your boots and you haven't been warm or dry in nearly a week. And that's just regular rain. What happens when some fluctuation in the weave causes magical storms, right? If that drizzling rain of frogs becomes a torrential downpour of giant frogs, you better watch out, right? There's tons of flavorful, challenging potential here. Four, not everything's an instant fight. It's easy to default to, okay, 2d4 plus 1 goblins, roll initiative. But monsters aren't necessarily going to attack everything they see. Check out this OG reaction table, utilizing a nice 2d6 bell curve. I love a good bell curve. Or this more complex one from the red box. Now we're talking. We're creating more variety in our encounters and giving the players some options, some choices to make. Maybe these goblins are just going about their business, right? They're coming back from a successful hunt and they'll be willing to trade some fresh meat or some information maybe about the local region if the PCs have something good to offer. Maybe they just fought a battle and half of them are injured. 
Maybe it's some weird goblin holiday and they're out celebrating and, hey, you're invited. Maybe they're excited to find a band of adventurers who might be interested in dealing with the edder caps and their phase spider pets that are encroaching on this forest and their territory. Five, not everything's a monster. Put some useful NPCs and potential allies on your tables. The players are going to be way more excited about rolling a random encounter when they know the blind priest wanders these golden hills handing out blessings, or that old turtle in the frog marshes makes the best potions, or merchants with magical goods frequent this trail. Hey, here's a bounty hunter who asked the party for help in capturing her quarry and is willing to split the reward, right? Rumors, quests, shopping, give them a little taste of civilization out here in the wilds or a dash of something that they would never see in town. Six, signs and portents. We can use random encounters to show what's coming up or what has come before. The table says Owlbear, but the party's level two and limping home after a near TPK in the dungeon. Well, maybe they hear that Owlbear before it perceives them, and with a little bit of luck and smarts, they can avoid it. Or maybe they come across Owlbear tracks and can follow them or run the other way. Again, give the players some choices. They can, you know, try to start the combat on their terms or avoid it entirely. Maybe they take a rest and then follow these tracks onto a, a nest lined in fur and feathers, and they wait for that owlbear to leave on its next hunt and find a few regurgitated owlbear pellets, and one has this little glint revealing a magical amulet contained within. Number seven, loot. If there's potential loot on the table, rolling a random encounter is way more like gambling now. Risky, but fun. Maybe it's a rare mushroom that is a valuable spell component, or an easily overlooked rock that's actually a semi-precious stone. Maybe it's straight up a coin purse, right? Or a scroll case just lying there on the ground. Surely there's gotta be a story here, right? The aftermath of some disaster, perhaps, or bait in a trap. It could be this exquisite elven statue, half buried by the centuries. This, this is worth a ton of gold to the right collector, but first we've got to dig it out and then transport it somehow. Treasure can be a reward, but it can also be a challenge, and it can tell a story. Number eight, no result can still be kind of interesting. The typical procedure by the book, which we're going to get into in the next video, is to roll to see if an encounter is triggered, and then if it is, to roll again on the encounter table to see what we get. In my latest game, I don't do it that way. It's just the one roll, you're always getting something. It sounds a little crazy, right? But half of the time, the result from that table is descriptive fluff. Right? Even without a classic encounter, what makes traveling through this place feel different than traveling through some other place? Flora, fauna, features, you can get real poetic with it or get gonzo weird with it, bizarre. You know, is it more effort? Sure. Whether I do it in my prep or I improvise it during the game, yes. Yes, it is. But it stops me from saying that very boring, nothing happens again and again. A full day of travel in a fantasy adventure where nothing interesting at all occurred, right? Or that day we saw the two giant fire badgers fighting under a razor thorn bush. Wait, were they, were they fighting or were they, um... Plus, you know, the, the players might have discovered something if they had stopped and investigated or cast animal friendship or speak with animals or something. And of course, they still could have turned that into a combat encounter if they were so inclined. I'll also have an entry for RP for roleplay prompts on there as well. Sure, sometimes I'm going to say, you know, the knight's first watch passes uneventfully, roll for second watch. But I'll also say something like, as you finish dinner and settle down for the night, the conversation turns to childhood memories. What do we learn about your character? I call it D20 questions. I keep a list. Sometimes I roll on it. Sometimes I just pick something. Sometimes I make up something else on the spot. It's great for tables that like RP, and it's also great for tables where RP rarely happens unless the dungeon master is prompting it.
Number nine, roll on the next table. I am a big fan of verisimilitude in my world building. Things can be weird and mysterious, fantastical, magical, but I like them to make sense together, to hold together. You're going to find foresty things on my forest table, and you're going to find different foresty things in the cradle wood than in the webbed wood than in the centaur's forest. But it's always good to have a little chance for surprise, a little spice, a little variety. So I'll often include an entry for re-roll on the next region's encounter table. Maybe it turns out the black tusk orcs came down from the mountain passes that they control. Interesting, are they raiding? Are they running away from something really scary up there? Are they on vacation, right? Alternatively, I'll also have like the same encounters appearing in several regions tables, especially those big bad ones that are low probability that the PCs have no chance of defeating, so they better play it smart. Yeah, I don't want to wipe out my party with a random encounter, but if you don't default to instantly rolling initiative, you can absolutely have some you know, low probability outcomes that are double the deadly challenge rating for them, right? Why is there a dragon randomly swooping down from the sky to bully you out of most of your gold? Because this is Dungeons and Dragons and you rolled snake eyes. There's a dragon on every table, right? That that young red dragon might sleep in the caldera of Mount Slag, but his territory stretches from these woods to those foothills to the river valley and the lost lake. There's always going to be a dragon or a giant, something way out of the party's league on every one of my tables. It lets them know this world is dangerous, not perfectly calibrated to always give them enemies that they can kill. It makes the world feel more real and bigger and it gives them something to aspire to at low levels. Ten. Roll twice on this table. What's more fun than roll again? Roll two more times. And what better way to make a random encounter more interesting than to combine it with another random encounter? If you quietly follow the trail of the shambling mound spore, it will lead you to the standing stones of the old druid circle where short rests give you max HP on hit dice, and when you wake up and set out, you have a charge of inspiration, right? Or it turns out that these goblins have a pet manticore, or they're in the middle of fighting one when the party comes upon them. So what, what do they do now? Hey, isn't that Bartleby the Scrivener who sold us those cool scrolls talking with those bugbears over there? What's, what's going on with that? Sometimes the dice are going to give us weird interactions that will take us to places we would never get otherwise, and sometimes they, they just won't fit, and you'll have to roll again or just select something else. And sometimes you can just do this, combining things anyway to see what happens, right? Purposefully grabbing a handful of entries here and sticking them together like Legos to create a big memorable encounter for your players. A uh, very powerful, though not necessarily antagonistic monster, perhaps from another region, uh, pointing a magic item in the face of a potential NPC ally at the edge of a cliff while hail is coming down, causing you know, 1d4 damage per round and creating difficult terrain. That's a lot of things, but I don't think boring is one of them. I truly hope you found this inspirational and picked up at least one thing to add to your game. You can even take these 10 ideas and make your own random encounter table for your world. 10 entries is plenty to carry you for several sessions at least. Put two entries in each and you have a d20 table, and then that's more than you're going to need for a while. If you've got other types of entries you like including on random encounter tables, I would sincerely love to hear about them down below in the comments. If you want a deeper dive into like the mechanics and the purpose of these checks and tables, check out the next video. Thank you so much for watching. Get out there, have fun, be kind, and I'll see you next time.